Buenas tardes, bienvenidos al Vitalik Inflation Tour 2021. Eh, vamos a hacer una conversación, un ida y vuelta. Van a poder dejar preguntas en Twitter. Ask Vitalik BA es el hashtag para que puedan dejar sus preguntas. Así luego se las transmire, transmitiremos junto a Oli Goldschmidt, que nos está ayudando hoy con el, el hosteo de este evento bastante especial, bastante único. Esto ocurrió en dos días. La idea surgió el domingo por el propio Vitalik, que dijo, no quiero que esto sea un viaje exclusivo, simplemente de vacaciones. Yo vine acá a querer ayudar a la comunidad de Ethereum Argentina, quiero ayudar al país. No es un viaje político ni preparado este, en ese sentido, simplemente una forma de conocer nuestro país donde ha despertado un montón de interés que es consecuencia de todos ustedes que están transformando a la Argentina genuinamente en un Crypto Nation, a Buenos Aires en una Crypto City eh, y tenemos la dicha y la fortuna de tener a la referencia más importante de la industria visitando nuestro país. Eh, sin más que agregar, comencemos la, la charla. Ready when you are. Ready? Yes. Ready, for maybe. <laughs> How are you liking Buenos Aires and Argentina? I'm uh, very impressed. I yeah, definitely was not expecting to see a, a, this, a, crypt, a, a community of anywhere close to this uh, level of uh, size and uh, energy. Um, just the number of people here, the number of projects here, the uh, excitement of the uh, people here, um, and as uh, Definitely amazing. It's uh, much more than I've expected, even more than I've uh, seen, I think, pretty much anywhere else in, uh, um, in the world so far. Um, so, yeah, no, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. I think people are incredibly excited that you are here. And mm -hmm. for what I've seen, had you experienced this level of rock star in anywhere else? No. No? <laughs> First time. Mm -hmm. How do you like it? Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Do you sometimes regret that you went public with this or? That's a good question. I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. Okay. Hmm. How would you describe the Argentinians uh, after the, these very first days that you were hanging out with us? How do I describe Argentina? Mm -hmm. um, I guess. Um, People seem uh, very friendly. The city is very nice. It's uh, it feels like a uh, you know a good place to spend time. Um, people the, the, the people here seem very smart and uh, very motivated. Like I think the the difference between here and um, some of the wealthier countries is um, that like in wealthier places there's people who are excited about like crypto as like the the ideas and the theory. But people here, like, they yeah, feel this very kind of genuine excitement that, like, like they deeply understand that, that this is something that's uh, solving real problems for them and like, very connected to, like, the fact that, they're, that, that like, blockchains and cryptocurrency are already providing, like, a lot of uh, value to people here, and, like, every day and, and, and very easily could provide uh, even, uh, even more value. Um, So that, I, like that kind of spirit, I think, is uh, something that's uh, just like very refreshing and very exciting to see. Has anything that you knew before from Argentina impressed you in any way? Mm, um, I, mean, I think I, I definitely had an impression before that like, uh, there were a lot of uh, excellent uh, Ethereum projects and even uh, projects that were like, recognized for uh, the, their value worldwide um, were either partially based here or at least had people here like uh, Queros. I've uh, been a, a fan of Queros for a long time. Part of uh, Quer the Queros team is here. Um, the yeah, Open Zeppelin and the yeah, Nomic team, I've uh, been very aware of their uh, work for a long time. Um, obviously, Proof of Humanity um, is... Uh, Uh, like proof of humanity is one of those things that I think is like really important. Um, it's, uh, I think, one of the kind of big missing pieces of uh, infrastructure that could really uh, make the uh, like the Ethereum world a uh, kind of a more inclusive place. Um, I've heard you talk about the onboarding aspect of 
proof of humanity. Exactly. Yes, I think uh, like one of the big benefits that I could see proof of humanity providing in the long term is that like if it provides people people the ability to just get like even a little bit of uh, cryptocurrency every month just by you know, putting up a profile, then like that makes blockchain applications much more accessible, right? Like even if it's uh, 25 cents a week, like 25 cents a week is not enough to pay for your food or your healthcare, but it is enough to, to ensure that you can send a few transactions on a roll-up, right? And so like I th one of the reasons why least, like I've noticed uh, some people from, I guess like you could call the more left-leaning decentralization space, like the, some of them are suspicious of uh, cryptocurrency is that like cryptocurrency based applications are not as accessible, right? Like you need to have cryptocurrency to get them, but like if we can just like reduce that barrier, right? So you can just like go ahead and start uh, participating, even if you're not like you don't have money, and even if you're not in a place where you can like get in, get cryptocurrency like, because you don't have exchanges. Like I think that can address that concern uh, quite a bit. So proof of humanity is great. Open Zeppelin is great. Uh, Kleros, uh, I yeah, remember about four years ago, I made this uh, post on Reddit saying like, "Hey, we should have decentralized courts." And then like one or two years later, like, "Hey, Kleros, it's a decentralized court. It exists." Um, so Kleros is great. Uh, Pope, the uh, proof of attendance protocol is um, also great. Yeah. So like all of these. Uh, lovely things that like people around the world have all known about for a long time like they they all come out of here so i think uh, you know there's just an amazing um, amount of uh, amount of talent here and I, yes mm -hmm. that amazing amount of talent is also mm -hmm. combined with a mm -hmm. difficult context to say the least yes. so how do you think decentralization could help a country that mm -hmm. has a shaken currency Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one of like the the impression I've gotten of uh, Argentina so far is that it's a uh, country that has a low state capacity but uh, very high people capacity, um, wow. and that's uh, uh, something that I think in some ways might even be the perfect uh, environment for uh, blockchains to make a big impact. Um, like it's uh, like just. The fact that you know the peso is uh, inflating uh, very quickly, and like people just understands the fact that like they uh, can't you know like they can't hold it for long periods of time. They have to like constantly work with money um, and like constantly figure out like how to like avoid getting hit by the inflation. Like constantly think how to like juggle between different assets. It's uh, like in environments where people can like see very clearly kind of like what money is, how money works, um, and uh, uh, one where people I think are uh, well already are open to new ideas, and uh, like I'm, I've definitely already been uh, seeing some uh, signs of like I, it's like lots of people who are just like not so much like restaurants and cafes yet from what I can tell, but just like regular people in just like various places who you know already accept uh, crypto as a form of payment and it's uh, you know providing value as a, a medium of exchange and a yeah, store of value already um, it there's uh, you know people um, working on like even just all of these like decentralized projects like uh, um, going beyond currency like all of these uh, you know the DAOs like um, NFTs like all of these things like I think people just like, understands the value very easily. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential. Um, though I think, uh, like, what kinds of uh, applications end up uh, working? I think, like, I pers like, I I can't even predict it ahead of time. Like, I'm terrible at predicting. Like, two, three years ago, I was on TechCrunch in San Francisco, and I told the, the entire stage that NFTs are overrated. <laughs> um, so, I, like, I think it's ultimately like, up to the Argentine people to like, uh, figure out what um, applications can succeed and to actually make it happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. And NFTs, any other prediction that you dare say today? <laughs> mm, um, I mean, like, I've, uh, I, I feel like DAOs are like the thing that's finally ready to happen. Um, it's, uh, like, DAOs are the sort of thing that I think requires some level of like, critical mass uh, to be able to get some adoption. Um, and uh, you know we've been seeing. Um, I think at the beginning there were like only a few DAOs, right? Like obviously there was the DAO at the beginning, and that ended up like that was this kind of experiment that was not thought through very well, like neither on the economics nor on the technology. Um, and people were predicting the economics would break, but the technology broke first, and of course you know that led to some uh, problems that we already know about. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, since like. 
over the last like maybe two years, we've seen this kind of second generation of DAOs where the economics and the technology are like, thought through much more. And like there's big DAOs and then there's little DAOs, like there's DAOs behind DeFi projects and then there's just like 20 people coming together and saying, hey, like we're the, like, we're the Buenos Aires DAO or like, you know, we're the, like, the DAO for this particular city or this country and like let's pull some resources together and like, just try to like do useful things for, um, our, for our home. And that's, uh, it feels like, it feels like the energy to make that happen is there. Um, it, um, like, it feels like there actually are a lot of, like, very cool and, and, uh, and useful things that could be done in that way. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to DAOs doing more over the next two years. Perfect. So, not overrated, just a little mm -hmm. old fashion, maybe? Yeah, well, there's like first gen, you know, DAOs were like, you know, first overrated and then underrated. And like, I'm hoping that over the next few years, they can become like properly rated and uh, very properly successful. Properly rated. Yeah, I'm hoping they'll become very successful again. Hmm. So, you think uh -huh. online communities that are starting to form mm -hmm. around DAOs will mm -hmm. end up meeting in, mm -hmm. in yeah. real. I, like, I feel like the kinds of like formats of uh, cooperation that are emerging naturally over the internet, like, they're, outpacing f formal structures very quickly already. But like even just one example uh, within the yeah, Ethereum Foundation, like when we, if we want to like do research around like improvements to the Ethereum protocol or improvements to zero knowledge proofs, improvements to VDFs, like any kind of cryptography, any kind of math, like what happens is like people just form a telegram group, like five people from the Ethereum Foundation come in, like two people from Starkware come in, one, but some people from Aztec come in, like some academics come in, and like people don't even really care about the formal structure because like the people, I think people subconsciously know that like the formal structure is stupid anyway, like they're just, uh, like what, what matters is like getting the people in and like actually, like, you know, doing the cooperation that needs to happen. Um, it's this kind of very flash organization style. And then, like, the, the great things end up happening, right? Um, and, like, we've seen that that kind of style, like, sometimes even happen very quickly, right? Like, the, like, like EIP 4488, that was kind of, like, specked out um, very, and, like, very quickly um, over the course of about a week. Um, EIP 4444, like, um, fairly quickly over a few weeks. Um, the, um, that was the, the, the history removal one that could uh, improve scalability. Um, EAP 4337 for account abstraction. That was um, like myself, um, then a couple of people from OpenGSN, a couple of people from Nethermind, and just like, you know, came together, made a Telegram group, figured it out over two months, and you know, now it's uh, just uh, uh, going from there. Um, and like the nice thing about DAOs is that I think they're like, a format for um, cooperation, like they're, they're, they're a formal structure that actually can be fast and responsive enough to uh, work in this kind of world. Uh, so. That's perfect you said that, so I can ask mm -hmm. about governments again. Amazing. Okay, so what do you think regulation would look like for mm. a country that's trying to attract crypto talent and capital? Mm. Um, I think, um, like there's, I mean, there's obviously a, a spectrum of uh, different things that uh, governments could do. Um, I, like, on, I mean, obviously on the more extreme end of the of the spectrum, there's like adopting legal, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or like Shiba or whatever as a legal tender. <laughs> and like, you know, for, like if you want, you can obviously do that. Um, though, I mean, like, I, mean, I personally am like a, a a fan of uh, you know approaches that are kind of like not top down and coercive, and where like these uh, these things happen like when you know you like you already have like a, a lot of uh, popular support for the thing, and it kind of starts off being grassroots. Um, so like just having you know one politician from the top kind of like push everything, and that's it. Like it can also be unhealthy. But you know like if you have that level of support, then like you could. But it's also like uh, like still unrealistic for I think most places now. But then on the kind of on the other ends, like just like much more marginal kind of lighter things. I mean the simplest one is obviously just like not going after the crypto community, like just not like um, you know taking all of these smart people that are trying to you know create all of these amazing ways for people to uh, be able to, you know, cooperate, like interact with each other, fund things and just like... That like one's e very obvious. Yeah, like either like, you know, not ban it, not make it like um, extremely difficult. I mean, it's obvious, but a lot of people do fail it, right? Yeah. Um, it's, so that's one. The other, like another one that's like a bit further is um, 
like legal structures that make it easier for um, like smart contracts and DAOs to interface with the real world. Um, so like the, the Wyoming DAO bill, for example, like I think it's clearly quite successful. Like there's a lot of DAOs that are actually registering in Wyoming and taking advantage of it. And like the reason why I think things like that are useful is that I think, you know, there is a lot of uh, um, opportunity for like DAOs as a structure to actually do things that like interact with uh, physical assets in the real world, um, particularly land, right? Like I've, uh, like both myself and like a lot of uh, economists I think are talking more and more about how like l markets for like land and uh, like real estate and physical property are quite broken in a lot of ways. Right, like if you just, you know, think about it very simply, like, you know, like most of the time you're either a landlord or you're a tenant, right? And if you're a tenant, then like often what happens is that you have negative exposure to the community you live in, right? Like if, you know, you're a tenant, you're, you're renting a place um, and then like some new industry becomes really successful but you're not part of it, like what do you see? Like you just see your rent going up, right? And like uh, that leads to people like often even understandably but like very unfortunately like even hating people that are trying to like br bring cool and successful things into places. So trying to like things like fractional ownership I think actually can fix that problem, right? Like if you instead of like having this binary, you know, you either have one place or you have zero places, like ha ha let people build up ownership over time, even like have collective ownership. Um, if you have like DAOs governing apartment buildings, then you could even have like, you know, quadratic voting or some kind of governance over common areas. Um, and, you know, if a, and a person could even start like renting and then kind of like buy in and get more and more shares of, of uh, proportion, like uh, fractional ownership over time. Um, so I think ideas like that, like they could be really good, right? I think uh, there's a lot of room for experimentation there, uh, but for that experimentation to be possible, like there has to be, a, you know, the legal environments that, uh, um, that makes it easy, right? Like the legal environment that makes it possible for people to do this without every project having to have like a $30,000 legal bill. Um, exactly. yeah, so that's another one. Um, a third one is just like, making it easy for people to come. Um, like, you know, I'm a big fan of just like, you know, visa on arrival programs for as many people as possible. Like I think, uh, you know, it's a global world and, uh, but at the same time, it's uh, a world that I think is uh, very unevenly global, right? Like, like for example, myself, like, you know, I, with a Canadian passport, like I have a lot of privilege, right? Like I can go to half the world and like, you know, I don't need to like plan visa stuff ahead of time. Uh, and I can just like go there and, uh, you know, like within a couple of minutes, the customs accepts me, right? And that's a privilege that a lot of people around the world, I, mean, I think even people with uh, pass Argentina passports don't have, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, like, I, and I think, especially in this kind of a modern world that like, depends so much on people being able to just like quickly come together um, and just like cooperate and do things, um, you know, people being able to just like more easily move around and come is like something that's uh, so valuable. Um, so like even just for ourselves, right? Like when the Ethereum Foundation figures out like when to, ho where to like, you know, host conferences, where to host meetups, like, you know, is it easy for people, uh, like, f is, it e is it easy for our global community to come into the place? Like that, that's one of the criteria. So the, I think the more, like the better any country does on that dimension, the, I think the more crypto friendly it is automatically. Lower the barriers. Exactly, yeah. Hmm. So, other than the regulatory aspects for a lot of these use cases, uh -huh. uh, we need a Ethereum to scale. Yes. How are things going on that front? Mm -hmm. um, so, right now, for like we have this, uh, you know, there's like a lot of things that are happening in parallel in the Ethereum protocol, right? Um, I, like about a couple of weeks ago, I published this kind of roadmap diagram trying to like, describe what's going on, where you know you have the merge, the surge, the verge, the purge, the splurge. These so are, this, this uh, new roadmap. So I right. was on the phases roadmap. So mm -hmm. now we have the merge, the splurge, the verge, the purge, and the surge. Yes, it looks um, so, like a poem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I mean, a lot like a lot of the ideas are the same. I just kind of like drew the boxes in different ways and gave and gave them funny names. I um, mean, <laughs> you know, I hope people like the funny names and use them. Um, but like the merge, obviously, proof of stake. Um, I think uh, you know we all um, I love uh, proof of stake. Well. Okay, I mean, I should say, I mean, 
there are important things that 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 do get lost with the switch to proof of stake, right? Like there's uh, like I think even if you look at like the early stages of mining, right, with proof of work, like Bitcoin from 2009 to 2012, it was this like very democratic thing. Anyone with a like a, a computer could just like go and get Bitcoin, right? And I think. Like if that did not exist, Bitcoin would not have succeeded, right? And and like with Ethereum too, I think the uh, six years of uh, mining that we've had so far, like in terms of just opening up the supply more and letting more people get ETH, I think it's done a lot of good. But at the same time, like in the long term, uh, like it's uh, an industry that centralizes more and more, and you start to, like you have to be a, a business, you have to have like access to cheap electricity, and at the end of the day, it also kills trees, right? Uh, so. The switch to proof of stake, I think, is like very important from us um, for for just for like the environmental reasons and also the efficiency reasons. Like, it's also an opportunity to make the protocol much better, to like, have uh, transactions confirm faster, to like make the network more efficient, um, add like light client support, just like a big long list of things. Um, so, very excited about the proof of stake switch. Now, the proof of stake switch by itself does not give any scalability, right? But it does make it easier to add more scalability later on. Um, so what's happening for scalability, right? This is uh, the surge. Um, so one, there's, two, there's kind of two tracks, right? There's layer one scalability and then there's layer two scalability. Back in uh, 2016, uh, Ethereum's scalability strategy was like very focused on layer one, right? Like there were all of these papers and ideas that we were writing where we would say, okay, you know, we would have all of these shards and then on every shard we would process transactions and then the protocol would provide complicated ways to move like assets and send messages between shards. Today, um, the, the, like the design is a bit different, right? Like there is layer one scaling and layer two scaling. So the idea of layer two scaling is you create these second layer networks that use the blockchain for security, right? And they're connected to the blockchain and they put a little bit, like some data for, uh, uh, from every transaction onto the blockchain, but, which they have to do for security. But most of the computation, most of the data, most things are happening off chain, right? And so what this means is that you have a system that can scale much more than the, layer, than, than the blockchain, but it uh, consume like it still gets all of the uh, security of the uh, blockchain, right? So, if everyone switched to rollups today, and if rollups became like as efficient as rollups could be today, then the scalability of Ethereum could go up by a factor of like about 100, right? So you go right right now, Ethereum pro go processes about. 15 to 45 transactions a second, depending on what kinds of transactions it is. With, if everyone moves to rollups and if rollups become efficient, then it could go up to like 1,500 to 4,500 transactions per second. So that's layer two scaling. Layer one scaling is, um, so Ethereum is doing sharding, but it's a simpler form of sharding. Like it's a simpler and a safer form of sharding that basically says, instead of trying to shard execution, transactions, smart contracts, data, like everything, the sharding just shards data, right? So like the Ethereum blockchain becomes like this kind of public billboard, right? It's like a place where you can post messages. And if you post a message, then like everyone is certain that everyone can see the message if they want to. And that billboard, like today it goes like, it goes up to like maybe 100 kilobytes to one megabyte every 13 seconds. After sharding, it will be 32 mega, uh, megabytes every 12 seconds, right? Um, so there will be much more space and rollups that use the layer one will have much more space to use. And so if you have layer one scaling and layer two scaling, they combine together, right? So today, 15 to 45 TPS, layer one scaling, 1500 to 4500, or sorry, layer two scaling, 1500 to 4500, layer two and layer one scaling together, like maybe 30,000 to 100,000 transactions. And then after, as computers get better, it can go like even higher over time. Um, so the future of uh, Ethereum scaling is bright. And I think the uh, amazing thing that has been happening over the last couple of months is that like rollups are not just the future, right? Rollups are the present. Like today, you can go and you know you can you you can move your assets to Optimism. You can do things on Optimism. You can move your assets to Arbitrum. You can do things on Arbitrum. You can move assets between Optimism and Arbitrum. Um, you can do a lot of things inside of a uh, Starknet. Um, st the Starkware has been doing just like a lot of amazing work with uh, zero zk rollups, which. Uh, 
use uh, zero knowledge proofs, and so they support things like instant withdrawals. Um, so you know, there's uh, like Starknet is something where the yeah, alpha just like launched, I think, a couple of weeks ago. ZK Sync has also been around. Um, it's like very programmable. Loopring has existed for a year, and I think uh, they're starting to like think and work on like, kind of turning into a fully featured, you know, EVM. Uh, um, at some point soon. Um, you know, Polygon, um, it, like, today it's still a uh, kind of like a trusted sidechain, but like they uh, like, bought the, uh, the, the, the Hermes team, which is an amazing decision by them. Like, you know, very happy that they, uh, you know, they listened to the community feedback, they listened to the community that like wanted something that has a stronger trust guarantees. And now they're working on, um, you know, Z uh, ZK rollups. Um, so, there's um, all of these uh, amazing projects uh, that are happening, and there's many more that I'm sure I even, I even forgot to mention. Like, there's just so many of these new teams, and like a lot of them, like they have things that you can go and use, right? Like, um, I, you know, like I just moved one ETH over to Optimism, you know, through Hop a few days ago, just to see how easy it is, and it's like not that hard. Um, so I think. Uh, Were you stressful, stressed anyways, or no? Um, no, no, I don't no think stress. I was stressed. No. Um, so I think like the user experience is only going to improve, and like developers now can actually like start to see you know what the experience of uh, layer two centric Ethereum will look like, and I think it will only get better from here. What a, well, let's say we're in this future where we have a hundred thousand TPS. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, during the first years of Ethereum, the use cases have been mostly financially oriented, like mm -hmm. DeFi, uh, because they have to be profitable contracts. Mm -hmm. But now that we have that kind of bandwidth. What new use cases beyond DeFi will emerge? What 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 uses of Ethereum mm -hmm. do you expect in a world where, you know, gas is cheap, mm -hmm. uh, bandwidth is is pretty pretty big? Hmm. I mean, I'm hoping that ENS is going to get used much more. I think ENS has been the still the most successful uh, non-financial Ethereum application so far. I mean, for those who don't know, ENS is the uh, Ethereum name system. Like, what it is, it's like it's basically a kind of decentralized phone book, right? So basically, like, anyone can go and register a name. So for example, I have Vitalik.eth, and there is a smart contract on Ethereum that stores a, a, a mapping that Vitalik.eth points to 0xd8da, blah, 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 right? Like, my Ethereum address. And so if you go in like any Ethereum wallet, like MetaMask supports this, Brave supports this, like I think all, all, all of the big Ethereum wallets support this. It, like if you want to send me money, which by the way, you, you shouldn't, um, <laughs> then, then yeah, like if you, like, you want to create a, yeah, like a dog coin and, and like, be, like advertise it as having my support, even though I, do, I, I don't actually support it and I've never heard of it, then like, you, know, you, can, you can type in vitalik.eth and then like type in how many trillions of dog coins you want to send and then you click send, right? Like you don't even have to copy paste my address. So, so that happened to you recently. I guess, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, but yeah, like, but like, please don't do that, right? Like, no. like it's give, very clear. No, no if, one like, here is sending you money. Yeah, like if you want to send, like first of all, don't create a dog coin. We've done enough dogs. <laughs> I think we should do monkeys. Like, <laughs> okay, like, okay. So, like, like if, if anyone here has been to Singapore, the Singaporean monkeys are like incredibly cute, right? <laughs> um, like, like if you go on my blog, vitalik.ca, there is an article um, and notes on 2020. If you just scroll down, I have a picture in there of like two of the Singaporean monkeys. They're just amazing. <laughs> um, so, and then in, I, I even saw in Costa Rica, there's uh, howler monkeys that are really lovely. I mean, you know, does Argentina have monkeys? Not uh, really, no. Not really, okay. But, you know, like, you know, Latin America has monkeys, I think, uh, you know, like, uh, it's, uh, we should have more monkey coins. Um, I, and uh, so if you make a monkey coin, instead of giving <laughs> half the supply to an individual, you should yeah. give half the supply to a DAO, and that DAO should fund charitable projects. It's happening right now. I, monkey <laughs> coins are okay. coming right now to a DAO yeah, next like, to you. Exactly, so if you make a monkey coin um, that <laughs> ha where half the supply goes to a good charity, then you know, I support you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> okay. The, um, wait, wait, okay. So we're talk we were talking about <laughs> ENS, right? ENS, right. Yeah, so <laughs> ENS, I think, is like an amazing Ethereum application. A lot of people use it. Um, I even moved my blog over to, like, I use ENS and um, IPFS, right? Because uh, 
like my like my blog is uh, stored on a centralized server, but the problem now is that like so like so many people try to like click on it and access it that like whenever I post a new article on Twitter, like the server just like gets dosed and uh, nobody can actually read the article for at least a few hours. And about that, yeah. your last article on your uh, on your blog post mm. was published while you were here, right? Yes. Was it influenced in any way? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess... Uh, Who should I ask? Uh, maybe. Um, like, is, uh, is crypto a, uh, a bulldozer? I mean, in some ways it is, and I hope it can be a very positive one. Um, the, um, yeah, so, like, basically so what I do now is, like, I uh, upload my blog to um, IPFS, which is, like, a, basically like a decentralized, uh, like, on, like, network that just stores files, and then you take the hash of the root of the, uh, of, of the directory on IPFS, and then you upload that to, uh, to um, ENS, and so now if you access vitalik.eth, through a browser that supports it, then like it asks Ethereum like, hey, what hash is, is Vitalik.eth registered with? And then you see the hash, and then it asks IPFS, you know, what are the files that are connected to the, that are connected to that hash? And you just download it, and it's like fully decentralized, scalable. Um, well, okay, today I think it's still like it, most of them still go through centralized gateways, but we're fixing that, right? Um, with proof of stake, we're fixing that. Um, with or we're fixing some of that, right? Because uh, with proof of stake, we're going to have uh, much better light clients, and so hopefully we can like get rid of Infura centralization, right? Like wallets are not going to have to talk to Infura. Wallets can like talk to like a whole bunch of light client servers, and they can actually verify the branches. They can verify the blocks, and you know we can have something that's like much more decentralized and secure. So, if you're a wallet developer, you know please. Proof of stake, merge. We can have much more decentralized wallets. Let's do it. Let's uh, let's get the ecosystem off of Infura centralization. Um, it's. Uh by the way, did you know that like the Infura logo looks very similar to the Chinese character for king? <laughs> <laughs> I just like I don't know. I just didn't. yeah, like the just like the metaphor. I just find it so funny. Um, but uh, <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, like, I know they're great people. I, you know, I really appreciate their work for like making Ethereum more usable. But I think, uh, you know, in 2022, we can make Ethereum decentralized and usable. Let's do it. What, um, what is but, your your fear? We, you know, we mm. we've seen recently like action mm. from some governments against proof of work chains. Yes. Against miners, specifically in China, mm -hmm. suddenly a lot of miners have to mm -hmm. find new jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. In Venezuela, mm -hmm. uh, the government superstitiously took mm. over a lot of mining <laughs> facilities. Mm -hmm. um, what is the risk with proof of stake where gov if, if a government wants to take a hostile action mm -hmm. against the network? You know, what's I, your yeah, fear? I actually think proof of stake is much more censorship resistant than a proof of work. This is one of the benefits that people don't talk about enough, right? Like people focus on like being more efficient and not killing the environment, which is all true. But uh, And very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is important. Um, but uh, the um, like censorship resistance aspect, right? Like with proof of work, what are you doing? Like basically, you're just creating this like big thing that consumes a huge amount of electricity that's just like extremely visible, you know, both to the power grid and probably to like anyone flying a helicopter over that like has an infrared camera, right? And so it's a very easy to detect and like if you're mining the go you know, the government can just like come in and just shut in and shut you down like you're probably even like way more visible than like the marijuana farms or whatever, right? Um, so like whereas with proof of stake, like all you need to be a proof of stake validator is, um, you know, you just uh, have a, you just have a computer, yeah, and the computer can be anywhere. And it's just like a tiny little computer, just like one tiny internet connection. The data bandwidth is like much less than someone torrenting. Um, so it's, uh, like I think it's very uh, censorship resistant um, and, uh, it's much more resilient in that way. Um, in that way, so you know, another good side benefit of proof of stake. Um, what else? Yeah, so that's proof of stake, right? Lots of benefits. Um, we talked about scaling. Lots of benefits. Um, I don't know. Do we want to like? T do we want to talk about the verge? I know it's it's kind of technical, like vertical trees. Um, basically, the idea is that like you'll be able to verify individual Ethereum blocks um, without like having this big hard drive that stores the state and without having to verify like every single block in history before that, I th which I think is really cool, right? Like you can basically have a node just like. You can verify Ethereum blocks, and like you can even verify any specific Ethereum block that you want. Um, you would, um, 
be able to like once you have a node, you just like turn it online and like just like start participating immediately. If you're a proof of stake validator, you're not going to need a big hard drive. You'll be able to like just go and like just you know even if you only have like a couple of gigabytes, you'll be you'll be able to just like go and be a staker. So I think would it's would you like, be able to validate from a mobile phone? That's uh, that's definitely my hope, right? Like I think, uh, like I'm definitely a fan of uh, mobile phone staking uh, because, uh, like, mobile phones are just like one great example of like a type of computer that lots of people have lying around that they're not using, right? Like if, uh, you know, like, there's just lots of secondhand phones, right? Like there's uh, there like every, there's lots of uh, people that just like wants to upgrade, and then like if you've upgraded, then you know you have a mobile, an old mobile phone, and then if you have two old mobile phones, like you know you should give someone to, you should give one of them to someone who doesn't have as much money as you do, and um, you know maybe like like they are computers, and they're powerful enough computers, I think, to to run the beacon chain as it is. I mean, like over time, especially as we add like things like zero knowledge proofs, and we can make verification more and more efficient. I mean, I'm optimistic about that. Um, that level of adoption. Yeah. So that's the verge. The verge is great. Um, what else is there? There's the purge, which is uh, like basically once again, like it's even more efficiency, right? Like nodes, like nodes don't have to, you know, store the entire like seven years of history anymore. Um, clients can get smaller because like in, in, because they don't have to like have all of this really complicated code for things from 2015 um so just like all of these different things that we, that we're doing to try to make the ethereum protocol kind of like get lighter become simpler become safer um over time um like i think uh like a lot of people sometimes like I mean, even especially from the, sometimes from the bitcoin side criticize ethereum for being this kind of like big bulky thing where you know it's hard to run a node the code is really complicated and all of these things but like there's all of these different things that are on the roadmap that are all about reducing that problem over time right like there's like virtual trees reduce that problem a lot uh, <coughs> the yeah, history pruning uh, reduces that problem by a lot um, even like the short the the layer two scaling strategy right like it uh, reduces that uh, reduces that problem by a lot um, so I think uh, like my personal hope is that I think over over the next five years, like, Ethereum is going to get significantly lighter um, as, a, as a blockchain. And I think like, that's, it's really important, right? I think uh, like today there's uh, a lot of projects that try to kind of sacrifice decentralization for short-term scaling. And like, I totally get why people are using those projects, right? Like, because uh, you know, people want like, like, to be on platforms where they can like, use them and like, where sending a transaction doesn't take like, two weeks salary, um, which is like, very fair. But I think you know, there is this roadmap. Layer 2 protocols exist already. Layer 2 protocols are like, much better than they were one month ago, and they'll be even better three months from now, and they'll be even better six months from now. Um, and uh, you know, we're going to have a future where we will have scalability, and at the same time, like, I think, uh, the Ethereum community as a whole like does really cherish decentralization. I, like if you just like look at the hard work that's being done by all the client teams, if you look at the hard work that's being done by all these layer two teams, like everyone really values this. And I think uh, you know people do uh, like people do see a, 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 a I think the same future that I see, where over the next five years, like the protocol is uh, going to be one that's uh, like much easier to participate in, like despite being m much more scalable than even what we see today. So one of the challenges other than the technical aspects mm -hmm. is the community and the leadership mm. in these protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you lead yourself, the Ethereum community? What do you think are valuable lessons mm -hmm. that uh, you as a leader of the community, mm -hmm. uh, like good practices and, mm -hmm. and a good culture that Mm -hmm. should be instilled into many of these projects and many yeah. of these ideas. So I guess like my view on leadership and uh, decentralization is that like to me decentralization is not an absence of leadership, right? Decentralization is about creating structures where like there can be leaders, but it's much more based on soft power and hard power. It's like like leaders cannot just like go and say, you know, this is the, this is the way it will be because it's my will and screw you. It's much like as, to, to continue to be a leader, you have to continue to um, earn people's respect, and respect is something that you can lose at any time, right? Um, and it's also it's about having structures where it's new leaders can emerge permissionlessly. Um, so you know, if someone has good ideas, then uh, you know they can kind of like rise up and be, and uh, get recognized naturally. 
And that's uh, something that I think, you know, the Ethereum community gets uh, better and better at, right? Um, I think, uh, like, there are definitely projects in the crypto space that's, like, uh, that, that do have this kind of approach to decentralization that like really is about kind of like the rejection of any kind of leaders at all. And like we, you see this sometimes, especially in the projects that kind of emerge as forks like, or even emerge as rebellions, right? Like, often, like the way that they start is that they start as a group of people that are unhappy about, you know, what they see as like a centralized and dictatorial decision made by some majority. But then they go off and they create their own thing, but then they realize that like, there's no, they don't really have a vision they can coordinate around, right? And like everyone is like too, or like focused on resisting that like in the, there's no good direction that the project actually ends up going, right? So the anger and, uh, is not enough. Exactly, yeah, anger, anger is not enough. You need a positive vision. I think, uh, I think that's true in politics. I think that's true in crypto. Um, and like one of, I think in Ethereum, right? Like it's gotten more and more decentralized over time. And I think we're seeing the emergence of like more and more excellent even like leaders over time. Like Danny Ryan, for example, has done a really excellent job of, uh, you know, coordinating, like basically being the bridge between the research community and the client developers um, and like pushing his vision for like how the merge actually uh, becomes a reality. Um, you know, like Justin um, has, uh, done a great job of kind of expressing his ideas for um, you know, like what, Ether uh, what Ethereum can be, how it can evolve uh, technologically. Um, you know, Dinkrad has uh, been uh, do um, doing more and more. So great leaders on the technology, um, great community leaders. Um, I think, you know, like even like Sante has been a uh, great community leader for Ethereum. Um, I think so too. Yeah, I th Thank there's you. Uh, a, yeah. I, you know, I think uh, the Ethereum community is, uh, like, I personally think it's uh, even already at the point where, like, you know, even if I disappear tomorrow, I think it's uh, going to continue to be a, 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 a really great blockchain. Um, obviously, I have no plans to disappear tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah. Well, hmm. So, how do you see, uh, in, let's say, in a couple of decades from now, mm -hmm. the younger generations have grown up, uh, these networks are scaling, are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Do you see this might bring a change in the landscape of the geopolitical scenario? It might mm -hmm. disrupt nation states. Mm -hmm. We might get cities yep. uh, emancipating mm -hmm. from countries or? Quite a bit. I mean, I think uh, like decentralized technologies in general are, I think, going to help smaller countries um, more than they will help bigger countries. Um, like, I think they're, like, there's a lot of trends, I think, right now, like, especially in centralized uh, tech that really are benefiting the bigger countries, right? Like, if you look at the charts, like, especially post-2008, like, a lot of the GDP growth has been going to the U.S. and China, right? Like, the U.S. has been, do uh, like, if you look at the numbers, it's actually doing great, right? Like, it's, uh, it's the one, lo one of the very few lines that's gone up, was going up before, and it's going up still. Um, China was going up before, and it's going up still. Um, obviously, slower than before, and it'll keep getting slower because, like, catch-up growth only gets you so far, um, but, you know, still going up. A lot of the smaller economies, like, you know, they're uh, fairly flat. Um, and I think, um, you know, the network effects of uh, a lot of these more centralized uh, technologies are a big part of that. But one thing that we've seen, I think, is that, like, not every game is a game that, that, that the big countries are better at, right? Even if you look at COVID, like, COVID, I think, is a game where it's not at all obvious that the, yeah, that the big countries do a better job, right? Like... Um, you know, like very small ones, like, you know, like New Zealand, for example, I think like did very well at the beginning. Um, the, uh, but meanwhile, um, you know, the United States did less well at the beginning. Um, Russia has, uh, you know, not, not been doing that, like, um, that well the whole time. Um, a lot of the uh, smaller place, like if you just look around in the world and like see like how well, how well the, different, the different places are doing at different periods. Like I see no correlation between like how big or how small a place is and like, um, you know, what its uh, fortunes have been. And like to me, the value of crypto is in enabling this kind of cooperation that's uh, much more transnational. Um, and so I guess like the question is like, you know, can, you know, like Latin America, for example, like get the benefits of like looking like a big country without actually, without actually being politically centralized. And, you know, maybe crypto is part of the way to make that an the answer be yes. Um, so that I, uh, you know, and you know, we've been seeing this already, like, as I mentioned, like, you know, Argentina has uh, had a, uh, 
Mm -hmm. a, a huge um, amount of uh, crypto talent uh, show, um, um, show up despite kind of not really being a center of the yeah, world economy in, in a, a more traditional way. Um, you know, we've been seeing a lot of great stuff come out of Singapore, um, a lot of, you know, great crypto stuff come out of Taiwan, um, a lot of uh, great, um, you know, like especially like really amazing zero, um, zero knowledge work, um, a lot of things uh, come out of even just like communities that are scattered between a lot of different countries. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, like crypto really is a, um, a big opportunity in that way. Um, so opportunity for smaller countries, an opportunity for countries that have not been winners the last for the last 15 years. Um, and I, I also think like a lot of consequences are unpredictable, right? Like there's the, you know, the, the famous quote that like a good sci-fi um, author predicts the car, a great sci-fi author predicts the traffic jam. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the question is good. like, you know, like what is the, like what are the unintended consequences that are going to come out of like any new technology? And like, I don't know. I think, you know, uh, I, I guess we're about to find out and see. What were ones that you got wrong? Predictions that I got wrong. I mean, I mentioned already, right, yeah. that I yeah, did not predict NFTs. Um, what else uh, did I hear? I'm only asking because you got many right. Mm -hmm. So mm. I'm, I'm going for the exception. Yeah, uh, let me think. Like, what are some uh, big things that I've changed my mind on? Um, obviously, like development schedules, how fast proof of stake would come out, how fast sorting would come out. <laughs> definitely very wrong on that. But then, like, I think every, like, like almost everyone has gotten that wrong, right? Like, I, yeah, like even, you know, the Bitcoin Lightning Network, for example, like it's, uh, like people were like talking about it as like an alternative to like increasing the block size as though it would actually get it like released within, the, within a, a similar amount of time. But then, you know, we're here five years later and it's still getting technical challenges. But like, that's fine, right? Like it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of these really br like brilliant and smart people trying to like take the ideas behind the Lightning Network and turn them into something that's like as efficient and as practical for real people to be able to use. Um, and it's just like, the problem is hard. And I think like a lot of the problems in like many kinds, like in Ethereum and in Bitcoin, um, and I think the like the newer chains are gonna discover this too. A lot of the problems are harder than they yeah, anticipated. I, uh, yeah, um, like people who have uh, been in Ethereum for a long time might remember uh, the, uh, the, the 2016 Shanghai attacks. So this is not the Tao attack, the Shanghai attacks. Um, so this is um, in September to October 2016, there was this period in Ethereum's history, like about one month, where some very smart hacker, we still have no idea who it was, <laughs> just like kept on finding bugs in the Ethereum protocol, right? Like it kept on finding like all sorts of different ways to make the yeah, Ethereum network slow down, like all, sort, all of the inefficiencies in the Ethereum client implementations. And like for a long time, Ethereum struggled, right? Now, one good thing about Ethereum, right, is that like one, like, I do think the community really values decentralization. And one of the ways in which it values decentralization is that we have multiple implementations, right? Like there's multiple different Im software implementations of the same protocol. And so like it's not, the developers don't control Ethereum, right? Like even, like one development team can't just go implement what it wants because well, they have to talk to the other development teams. And at the time in 2016, uh, we had two implementations. There were Geth and a Parity. I mean, today we have Geth, Nethermind, um, you know, Be uh, uh, Teku, and uh, Aragon, right? Um, and then also for the uh, you know consensus layer clients, you know, there's uh, uh, Prism um, and uh, Lighthouse and, and uh, Nimbus. Um, and um, Lodestar more and more. Um, but at the time we had two. And the attacker was not able to break both clients at the same time, right? Like sometimes the attacker would be able to find some attack that would break the way the Geth client does things, but then Parity would keep working. Sometimes the attacker would find things that uh, Parity could not handle, but Geth would keep working. And so like the power users, they would just run both and they would just like switch from one to the other, right? But the Ethereum network still had this period of one month where we just like, it was this constant ongoing cyber war where, you know, like almost any minute, like the attacker would just like come up with some new attack and then oops, the chain, you know, the chain is really slow again, we have to make a fix. Um, and it would be this big back, uh, back and forth. Um, eventually we even have to do a hard fork um, to like the attacker eventually did find a bug in the actual protocol, but you know, only one. 
Um, it was the, uh, like, making lots of self-destructs happen very cheaply. Um, but then after that, like, eventually we won. Um, and so, you know, any new chain that exists, like, eventually they're going to get their Shanghai attacker. Um, and, you know, are they, are they going to be able to, to handle their equivalent of a, a Shanghai attacker? We're going to see. Um, so Maybe you can tell them how you managed to do it. You should give some advice to the Solana folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, like, obviously, like, make sure, like, to do, a, like, do a good job of figuring out like what, how the gas pricing works, right? Like a lot of people don't do gas pricing well. It's a hard problem. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, like the simplest hack is to just copy the EVM and then find some like wrappers to parallelize it, right? Um, which uh, there are actually some good ideas on how to parallelize the EVM. Like there is EIP six four eight, which was like I think it was called easy parallelizability. It was my proposal for how to turn the EVM into something multi-core. Um, like I've talked to the Optimism people about this, and they're excited about trying to implement it. I mean, I think Arbitrum people might be as well. So like if I was let's say Binance Smart Chain, right? Because like Solana so far ha has taken the route of saying they're going to create their own EV their own VM. But if you're just copying the EVM, then like which BSC has done, right? And BSC, had the, you know, they do have a lot of users. So if they want to like get more scaling by parallelizing, then you know maybe they could implement EIP six four eight, and then like they could actually make a serious contribution to you know Ethereum ecosystem research. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> hope they do. Um, open invitation. Um, so. Yeah, no, like this, um, they're like scaling tricks are definitely this kind of really fascinating and tough challenge. And I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, both how these like other layer one chains and also how so the, uh, the layer twos and like the uh, Ethereum roll up family manage to solve them over the next couple of years. It will be really fun. <laughs> so beyond the crypto mm -hmm. and Ethereum, I, I heard that, for example, you have an interest in life extension technologies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like what, what areas of tech are you mm -hmm. looking into and, and mm -hmm. why you have interest in those mm -hmm. areas? Yeah, I mean, I think biotech in general is very exciting. Like I think it's very possible that we're going to see as much progress in biotech over the next 70 years as we saw in computing over the last 70 years. Right? Like if you think about computing over the last 70 years, like in 1950, you know, like we had these big computers, like I think we had the ENIAC for the first time. Um, and, and even in the 1960s, like we had these big computers that were like the size of a room. And the science fiction of the time, you know, it was predicting that everyone would have flying cars, we would be going to Alpha Centauri, and like we would have, you know, like these machines that would make magic food for everyone, but the computers would, be, would still be as big as a room. What happens in reality, we don't have the flying cars yet, though that might be changing soon. Um, you know, we don't, we're not in Alpha Centauri yet, um, but, you know, the computers, like, the computers are tiny, you know, but like, you know, the, and, but, and the computers are so much more, like, even more powerful than, than what the sci-fi was projecting. Um, so, like, in, what is the equivalent of, like, ENIAC to a modern smartphone for biology? And I think the equivalent is, like, going from where biology is today, which is already amazing, right? Like, the, yeah, if you look at, like, just how quickly the COVID vaccines managed to be developed, like, I think it's, like, a massive testament to human ingenuity, right? Like, the vaccines, like, basically, like, it went from the viruses being sequenced to people figuring out what the vaccine would look like, like, you know, within a few days to a few weeks. So, like, the only, like, the only reasons I think we uh, did not have vaccines, like, half a year before we actually did are, like, procedural reasons, right? Like basically, people are like people are much more afraid of negative consequences as a result of action than they are of negative consequences as a result of inaction, right? Because if there's negative consequences because of inaction, like who do you blame, right? Um, and uh, um, so I think like it's only because of human problems that like you know we didn't we we like we didn't just like already have everyone vaccinated by the end of 2020, um, and uh, like so. The state of that technology is amazing today, but like, what would that be? Pl that plus 70 years. Like, I'm already reading articles that say like, oh, there's like some Japanese team that's developing vaccines against uh, senescent cells. Um, senescent cells are like this one. Uh, basically, what what happens is that like cells like 
have problems in them. And normally when a cell has a problem, like it commits suicide, right? Like the fancy biology term for this is apoptosis, like the cell just blows up. But sometimes the cell breaks in such a way that like even the mechanism for the cell apoptosizing also breaks. And so they just kind of sit there and the cell just kind of keeps, you know, spewing poisons in your body. And there's like this theory that this is one of the major mechanisms for how aging happens. Like there's just more and more senescent cells and they keep like spreading junk in our bodies and this like causes things to degrade. Not the only mechanism, but one of them, right? And like apparently this team, like this team has like a vaccine that might be able to like do something against these cells. And they're not the only project, right? Like there's even like studies that are looking at the question of like, you know, if you just like basically like replace a big chunk of like people's blood with like basically water and protein once every year, right? Like, you know, would that by itself be enough to get rid of the senescent cells? There's even studies that show that like, you know, is donating your blood once a year like enough to have some impact? Um, so a lot of studies, a lot of research, um, both kind of like very low tech things and like trying to figure out if it works and also very high tech things. Like we're still in the stone age of like figuring this stuff out, but I can easily see 70 years from now, like us being able to like basically reverse aging to the point and like basically do with the human body what we can do like with cars today. Um, and uh, like that kind of future is going to be really amazing in a way that I think people haven't adapted to yet, right? Like lots of countries around the world have big demographic problems. If aging, you know, stops being a problem, then, you know, they don't have demographic problems anymore. Um, you know, if, uh, like, population decline, huge problem. We might not have population decline as a problem anymore. Um, and, you know, population's gonna go up, well, you know, guess what, like, there, we also have these amazing people that are figuring out how to, like, to, um, how to set ourselves up on Mars. And um, we're even figuring out ways to, like, just, you know, do much, much more efficient and better agriculture here on Earth. We're figuring, like, there's technologies for carbon capture, there's, like, technologies for just, like, improving the uh, environment on our, um, even on our own planet as it is today. Um, so, there's just, like, technologically, there's just so much that we could be excited about um, that, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the 21st century in a lot of ways is going to be a really great century, and I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of things for, like, people everywhere to be excited about. Well, uh Guys, yes. so I just wanted to let everyone know that Ask Vitalik BA, it's trend topic now, yes, in Argentina. Trending topic, all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've been sharing with you and you, yes, different questions, like six, seven questions each, some social, some technical, yes, for Vitalik, done from the people from different places. In, we have people from Spain, but from everywhere in the world. Right? Everywhere. So this is what I suggest. Uh, Olivia, if you want to do a one, one of yet question, uh, you can do it, but start reading and choosing which ones you want to answer. Perfect. Okay. So Thank you. Here's one. What do you think, which is the best role politics should take towards crypto adoption? I feel like I've, t I've talked quite a bit about that already, right? Okay, let's go to the next one. Sure. Is there a scenario in which you would say Ether Ethereum failed? Mm, um, I think if Ethereum fails to scale, then Ethereum definitely fails. Um, if Ethereum succeeds at scaling, but it turns into something that's very centralized, then I think it's also failed. Um, if Ethereum succeeds at scaling and at being decentralized as a blockchain, but nothing interesting gets built on top of it and no one actually like, gets value from it, then it also fails. So those are all risks. And I think um, you know, those are definitely things that we really need to like, try hard to guard against. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot of people who are like, in the community who are very dedicated and who are trying hard to guard against all of those things. So I'm optimistic. Do you Sorry, oh, sorry. You both the... Do you think that ETH might end, this is not even about the flippening, might end the dominance of BTC or like op make BTC obsolete? I feel like what's happening with cryptocurrencies is that like it's one of the reasons why it's hard for any of them is about to, to go to zero is that like they get really dedicated communities, right? Like these aren't just products, like these are ecosystems around communities that have values. Um, like, if you talk to Ethereum people and if you talk to Bitcoin people, like the, the things that they talk about, the things that they care about, the, uh, you know, the, the ideas that they have about technology, the ideas that they have about politics, about society, like they're, a lot of them are very different, right? Like they're, 
You know, like if I uh, if like if I went on a Bitcoin stage and I talked about how much I love the vaccines, I'm sure people would like throw things at me. <laughs> um, but maybe in some places, maybe not everywhere. Um, but uh, the um, so. Like, just because of that, I think, uh, you know, like, Bitcoin is not going to go away. Like, even if, you know, Ethereum scales, even if everything I say about, like, it be becoming more decentralized turns out to be true, look, there's just going to, there is going to be this big, like, group of people that still is going to love and stay with Bitcoin because it's, like, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the people that they, uh, that they love and that they've grown up with. Um, so, grown I think... Grown up with, that's a harsh one. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 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 it's... Uh, I, you know, I really do think that you know both Bitcoin and Ethereum have uh, enough people that are kind of like very you know, just like dedicated with their with their lives to it to that extent that it's uh, you know neither of them are going to disappear. Um, so, you, know, I mean, you know these really are digital nations in that way. Another one. What's your opinion about NFTs, communities, and projects in art and gaming? Hmm. I mean, I am. Like I'm very happy to see that um, you know NFTs are um, like just are so successful among among artists. Like I think uh, you know thing like art is a yeah, like it is a public good. It's something that provides value to a lot of people, but it's something that can be very difficult to find business models for directly. Um, and the fact that NFTs are coming to exist as a business model, I think, is something really amazing. Um, it's uh, like I'm definitely happy to see just like there being more models for funding things. Um, the chel the so that's like the good side, right? And uh, like what I'm what I'm hoping for now, I think, is to try to like one is uh, I think. Uh, like you can't declare victory until you've survived at least one like full market cycle, right? Like okay. NFTs so far, like okay, they, you know, this this has been a bull cycle, um, and NFTs have done well, but we have not seen a bear cycle yet. Yes. Are NFTs going to survive a bear cycle? You know, are any of like are you know the crypto punks and the opti punks and like all of the you know, the what, you know the loot and the ether orcs and all of this stuff like are you know are they going to go to zero three years from now, like or you know. The next time that, like, you know, Bitcoin or ETH go down by 80%, which, you know, nobody knows where they start from, but, you know, people have to be prepared that, that, that like, wherever the, the bear market starts from, you know, there is going to be a bear, and everyone should be, like, psychologically prepared for that. You know, are the NFTs going to drop by 50% or 80% or 99%? We don't know yet. I think, uh, like, until NFTs as a thing have survived a full cycle, like, I think it's important for us to kind of not declare victory with NFTs yet, right? Because, like, ICOs were a bubble. Lots of ICOs ended up failing. Are NFTs going to last? We'll see. Um, but I think part of the solution to NFTs lasting, like part of the way in which NFTs can become something that lasts, is if we start seeing NFTs that have more functionality attached, if we start seeing NFTs that are not just about like buying and bragging, but NFTs that are like about like, oh, I have this thing and I can use this thing to do things. So, like this is a virtual item and it has some value in this kind of virtual, you know, decentralized metaverse that we're all co-creating. Like, if we can come up with something like that, then, like, that's an NFT that I think could have very meaningful long-term value. Um, so, like, is that art? Is that a game? I don't know. Like, I think, you know, the categories are all merging, right? Yes. Like, yeah. Like, I don't, you know, Entertainment, information. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, it'll all come together. And I think, like, the, like, what's the combination that can actually succeed and that actually can provide the sustainable value to people? I think we're going to find out. You mean uses besides, like, something mm -hmm. that good for the community and owns them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, this one in Spanish. Oh. ¿Qué, pre ¿Qué le preferí, tacos o asado? <laughs> oh, uh, tacos. tacos. <laughs> <laughs> Con, con tenedores duros. Yeah. Hard forks. Oh, hard forks. Sí, 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 tenedores duros. Here's a question from the audience. Um, I was wondering about what you think about the implications of decentralization of illegal activities. Mm. Interesting. Um, I guess, uh, like, it depends what kind of illegal activities. I mean, I think, um, you know, for as long as there have been rules, there have been uh, people breaking the rules. Um, and, but there's obviously some, illeg like, some illegal, act um, illegal activities that are like actually totally fine. And then there's some illegal activities that, that, um, that are harmful. And there's some um, that 
I like, don't really need decentralization, and there, but there's also some that do need decentralization, um, or or that at least be do benefit quite a bit from decentralization. I think um, like ultimately we can't solve every problem, right? And there has never been an age in human history without problems. Uh, but you know there are things that we as a community can do to try to mitigate at least some of them. Like one example of a uh, an illegal activity that I think is bad and where I think like we can do something is scams, right? Mm -hmm. Like scams are, I mean, they're bad, they're illegal, they're, uh, and they are something that I think is harmful, like both to society um, and to, um, especially in lower income countries where there's a lot of people who don't have financial um, um, education and like there's just like, you know, people who are bad people and that are trying to like go after their savings. Mm -hmm. um, and we as a community I think could make an impact by trying to like do more in like both warning people about the scams, um, even like people who make things like wallets, like people who make the gateways that people use to access the crypto world, like they could do more in trying to like be very quick and proactive in like detecting what the scams are and like you know like if people end up like going to going into them without uh, without realizing it then like actually stopping them. Um, so you think uh, that level of um, uh -huh. control is going to come from inside the crypto community? Um, I mean, I think, like, obviously, if it doesn't come from the crypto community, it'll come from governments. But if it comes from governments, then, like, you know, we know, like, as I said, right, like, like you know, Argentina, you know, low state capacity, high people capacity. And, like, that's, uh, <laughs> I think it's... Uh, even, that might be our best slogan yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's true of a lot of places, right? So, like, the government solution, if it has to come to that, like, will be very ham-fisted. It's going to end up destroying a lot of good things. Like, we even saw this with ICO. Right, like, we even... The I, government is yeah, no, no, <laughs> tampering with the um, mic. Yeah, um, you know, we even saw this with ICOs, right? Like, I think, like, ICOs, like, they caused a lot of problems, but also, like, a lot of very beautiful things came out of ICOs. Like, just one personal example of, like, I think something very beautiful that came out of ICOs is that, like, there's a lot of projects that had big U.S. communities and big Chinese communities, right? right. Like, and there, there were projects that were really global and, like, really, like, that actually did manage to, like, stretch across barriers where institutional cooperation is, like, very difficult, especially in the, yeah, modern environments right and like the only way that could happen is that it's grassroots to grassroots and like you have projects and you have people on you know both sides even on all sides that saw the ICO and that and that bought in and that became part of that community a lot of the more modern uh, like uh, and these more centralized projects they uh, like they end up getting VC funding right and the problem with VC funding is that like you know you it, it's just, it's a format that naturally like pushes you toward getting your support from the same group of people who all know each other, right? Because mm -hmm. like getting like getting funding from VC is like it requires talking to people and you're gonna talk to people who you trust, like you have to have the trust in the relationship. Um, and so you're just gonna, you're going to go for, for what is familiar, right? Um, and what the result is that, you know, j there's just a lot of projects where the initial coin holder base is like very US centric. Um, and you know, like I'm a very big, you know, I'm a b believer in this kind, you know, like in the idea that like the crypto space is global. And I think, um, you know, it's like, I think if you are going to be pro-freedom, then you have to be globalist to some extent, right? Like, you know, you have to be something that's uh, not centered around one country. Like you have to be about like people from, uh, anywhere around the world, like being able to and, act and, like, and actually uh, uh, participating. And that's something that I think Bitcoin did very well. I think that's something that Ethereum also did well. Um, but if a project has a centralized beginning, then like it's very difficult for it to actually like kind of break out of that box, right? And I think like the, the reason why projects now are going for VCs instead of ICOs, a lot of it is regulation, right? Now, I do think that we have a rounds two, right? And the rounds two for a kind of decentralized launch is DAOs, right? There are a lot of projects that are even launching as DAOs. There's projects that are turning themselves into DAOs very quickly. And like, that's beautiful, right? And I think that actually is a chance for us to kind of go back to projects that do have this kind of decentralized community driven beginning. Um, but it's a place where, you know, we have a responsibility to make sure that goes well. We have a responsibility to promote norms that make sure that this um, happens well. We have a responsibility to kind of set up the tools so that people know what they're getting into, um, to promote structures that are, you know, difficult for scammers to take advantage of. Um, and like, you know, either we can do a good job 
job of all of these things or we can do a bad job of all of these things and five years from now the space goes back to centralization. Um, so, you know, it, which one is it going to be? I think, uh, you know, we as a community have that choice. How, mm. how do you see, I promise this is a question from, from the audience, but mm. uh, how do you see Ethereum uh, disrupting social media through things like proof of humanity and, mm -hmm. and all of these, you know, yeah. things that can, can help bring accountability? Mm -hmm. I think um, social media is one of those places that's like very ripe for like new and innovative uh, ideas in mechanism design. Um, because like the problem with, with like social media is a mechanism design problem, right? Because um, it's a problem, like it's a place where like you, uh, the whole thing survives because of inputs that are provided by its users, right? Like without its users, a social media platform is nothing. But then it's also an environment where like you have to really make sure that you're encouraging users to do the right things and discouraging them from doing the wrong things, right? Like if you look at even just Twitter, for example, right? Like it's a platform that's just a, like, you know, there's a, there is a lot of good that can come out of it. There's a lot of good friends that I've made from uh, uh, Twitter conversations. But at the same time, it's an environment where it just easily encourages this kind of like very, um, you know, moralistic, righteous, just like everyone yelling at each other. Um, and it's like, you know, that's not good for, new, for nuanced discussion. That's uh, not good at, for kind of positive sum discourse. Um, and, you know, Twitter also has a lot of these problems with, um, you know, like spam. Like if anyone has uh, looked at, you know, the response as to anything I tweet. Like, it's just that, like, you know, I tweet something about, um, you know, even just, like, some philosophical article that's total, that's almost not related to crypto, and people are like, Vitalik, what does, oh, look, he mentioned Cosmos. Look, this article <laughs> mentioned Cosmos. This means that Vitalik supports atoms, and you should buy atoms. <laughs> look, hey, when is ETH going to go to 10,000? Um, you know, look, uh, oh, look, he said this thing, like, look, this, mean, this means that the future is Octagon Coin. Everyone should go buy <laughs> Octagon Coin. I actually have no idea if Octagon Coin exists. If it doesn't, then, like, you should launch Octagon, Octagon Coin and you should give um, seven-eighths of the supply to charity. That would be amazing. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, so, like, but if, Octa, if Octagon Coin exists today and it doesn't do that, then I don't support it. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, so, like, it's just, and then, obviously, there's, like, like a lot of like manipulation with people having like tens of thousands of fake accounts that just like like and retweet everything. Um, I think I saw like even someone made this really fun demonstration where like they made a tweet I think that was like complaining about was it like the lack of like quality of of like basically Twitter moder uh, like um, abuse prevention, and then within 15 minutes like they they bought 5,000 likes for that tweet, which is <laughs> uh, it was just like so fascinating to see that. Um, so. Like, better mechanism designed to kind of reduce the exploitability of social media, I think, is a big problem. And, like, the reason why it's important, right, is because the other thing that we want to avoid is, like, we want to avoid centralized solutions to that problem, right? Like, I, like once you have a centralized solution, like, if your solution just, like, depends really heavily on, like, this opaque group of people um, or an opaque group of algorithms deciding what's good and bad, then, you know, you've basically created this like completely unaccountable thing that like nobody understands and it has to be opaque because if it wasn't if it wasn't opaque then the scammers could figure out how to dodge it uh, but then that ends up like basic having this huge amount of control over I mean, you know like culture and politics and society and like that's also bad right so if we can have social media that's good at in, like encouraging people to contribute good things and not contribute bad things and do so in a way that is based primarily not on like centralized moderation, but on like the, like open, transparent, and decentralized kind of in, like mechanism design and incentives. Like that's something that could be like really good for humanity. So I really encourage people to do more experiments in that direction. Like I know people are. Are we happy about Jack leaving Twitter? That's a good question. Um, I mean, like, that whole thing is, like, a mystery, and I think, like, you know, there's a lot of different possibilities, right? Like, whenever someone leaves something, you always have to read between the lines. Like, corporate press releases, ab corporate press releases about people leaving are almost never sincere. Like, that's a rule. Um, so, <laughs> They're never sincere. Yeah, so, you, you know, you have to ask, like, you know, what is the inside story? Like, did Jack get fired? Did Jack maybe leave because he saw that, you know, there's a, there, that there isn't that much opportunity to do things from Twitter on the inside and like did he want to just focus full time on you know promoting like his you know vision
provision of open permissionless finance through Bitcoin on Square. I mean, I don't know. I, yeah, you know, I don't have access to the inside of his brain. Like, I actually, I feel like I have, like, actually, you know, few of these, like, magic backdoor communication channels than people think. We're like, even all these government <laughs> people I talk to, you know, that's not me. That's, like, you know, the uh, other local community people. Why um, he still has yeah. his handle. He tweeted last night something about mm. Web3 and VC funding. Yeah, like Jack said that he does not like Web3. That was uh, fascinating. I think, uh, I don't know, I think part of it might be this kind of like this Bitcoin mindset that says that like money needs to be decentralized, but like everything else centralization is totally fine, right. which yeah. like I personally don't get. I mean, I don't know, maybe Bitcoin people can make a, can like make a defense of it. Maybe they can make a, a tweet storm or maybe a blog article and they can upload it to IPFS. Um, <laughs> the, um, I mean, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's not my viewpoint, right? Like right. that's uh, their, v so I think uh, IPF, like, what was it? Like to me, decentralization like is, and like especially the idea of credible neutrality, this idea of like creating mechanisms where like when you need to, you know, like have kind of engineer, like some kind of engineering like protocols to like encourage people to do more good things if you were bad things, like having that be based on open and transparent rules where everyone can understand like why those rules are there and why those rules like don't just like favor one political party um, is, uh, something that I think is uh, really valuable. And I think that's something that, you know, the Ethereum community, for example, understands very deeply. Um, so I, you know, you know, I want more decentralized social media. I want more decentralized currency. I want more decentralized stable coins. Well, okay, no, I think stable coins are actually fine. Like I think pe <laughs> most of the time people who like innovate and say, oh, look, I have a new stable coin that has like better algorithmic governance. Please VCs give me $25 million. Like, that seems to have a very bad track record, and it's, well, unless you're a hacker, then it has a great track record. Um, so, stable coins are okay, but like, we need more, um, we need more uh, innovation in DAOs, we need more um, really good work in like layer two scaling and privacy, um, in interfaces between decentralized technology and the physical world, like more uh, startups or even like DAOs um, working on, like way, things like fractional ownership of real estate that I mentioned before. Um, like, yeah, I, mean, I, I think we need all of this stuff. I think uh, the value of decentralization goes far beyond money. Um, I guess uh, if, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, yeah, you know I, love, I love cryptocurrency, I love Web3, I love blockchains, I, mean, I love zero knowledge proofs, um, I think. Um, I, yeah. Do I love distributed ledger technology? Um, if, the, if the ledgers are politically decentralized too, then I love it. Um, I mean, like, consortium chains, I think, have clearly mostly failed. Um, so, yeah, no, everyone keep building. Okay, another question from the audience. Uh -huh. <laughs> everyone keep building. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, no, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the last question from the audience. What advice would you give to a young 18-year-old, you know, dreaming about the future today? Mm, um, I mean, I think um, the, like, the world is open to you. Um, I think it's, uh, we're entering this point where like, there's a lot of like, elements of the old order that are collapsing. And that's true in technology, it's true in politics, it's true in economics. Um, it's, uh, um, but at the same time, we're at a place where we're not really sure what the, what the uh, things that replace it are going to look like. And it's uh, you know, part of your choice, part, or like, it is your opportunity and uh, your uh, responsibility to like, be part of uh, figuring out what that solution is and uh, helping to build it. Um, so, you know, the world is open. Um, it's uh, I, like blockchains in particular are a space that is, uh, I, I think, still very accessible. Um, there's a lot of different communities you can go in and like participate, try to build something, um, you know, talk to people locally, um, you know, go online, join the discords, join the telegrams, um, and uh, like try to figure out and see if there's uh, something um, um, out of this space where the, that you can be part of and, so, and uh, something great that you can make. Vitalik. I, I think a big thank you is mm -hmm. in order from all yeah. of us to you. Mm -hmm. I think so that thank I, you very much for mm -hmm. coming here. Mm -hmm. It means a lot. Mm -hmm.
I should also say thank you to the, uh, you know, to, uh, thank you to Rodolfo, thank you to Santi, thank you to just uh, the amazing community here for just like organizing this whole thing, like going from n having no idea this will happen to like being here with 800 people, you know, very well executed um, work within like, was it like 55 hours? Um, you know, as I said, very high people capacity. It's uh, <laughs> amazing. Thank you. It's a famous candy for Okay. What is it? Thank you, Vitalik. Vitalik, I've done, hello, hello. I've done several events, yes. I don't remember to see such a packed mm -hmm. event yeah. yet. Yes, so congratulations. Mm -hmm. You are changing. Yeah, congratulations to, and, to Argentina. And we had thousands of people watching online mm -hmm. uh, at mm -hmm. the same time. It is not an understatement yeah. that in these five days you've been in Argentina, mm -hmm. yeah. very likely you have mm -hmm. changed the history of this country. Mm -hmm. And we will see what happens in the future now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vitalik, okay, for well, coming to our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is not a commitment. I just hope you are able to come back to Argentina mm -hmm. soon, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. And if you plan, come back on December mm -hmm. next year because we're doing a bit conf here, so. Okay, oh. we'll keep that in mind. Muchas gracias a todos por venir. Gracias a todos. Ha sido una noche inolvidable. Uy! Curriculums, ¿qué es eso? Curriculum. Sí, viste. Oh, well, a big, big, big round of applause again, please. Aww.